Okay, so we talked about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. That's what we did yesterday. Today we're going to start talking about the different parts of eukaryotic cells. We're only going to do a couple of them. So first, the outermost portion of a eukaryotic cell would be the plasma membrane. It's also called the cell membrane. Plasma membrane, cell membrane, same thing. <coughs> Some books even call it the plasma lemma, like L-E-M-M-A, one word, plasma lemma. It's all just different words for the same thing. So the job of the cell membrane is to control what enters and leaves. This way there's a semi-permeable barrier and that allows the cell to carry on different functions and maintain a different internal environment than what's outside of the cell. And its design is a phospholipid bilayer bilayer as in two, so it's two layers of phospholipids. Now, in the diagram of the membrane, if you look up there on the, on the screen, what's representing the phosphate groups on the lipids? Anybody know what's representing the phosphate groups? Yeah, on the, in the drawing, what's representing the phosphate groups on the phospholipids? Good, the red balls, those are the, those are the phosphate groups. And then the two chains are the fatty acid tails coming off of that. And why are they all wiggly, the fatty acid tails? Yeah, they're kinky, right. They're unsaturated, and that's what keeps the, the cell membrane sort of fluid. The next chapter we do is just on the cell membrane and osmosis and diffusion. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail about it now. So the heads, the phosphate parts, are hydrophilic. They like water, which makes sense because, of course, we all learned biochemistry last chapter. And phosphate is PO4, and it's got all these negative charges, and charged things dissolve well in water. So the heads are hydrophilic. The, f the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. They don't like water. So this is what's going to prevent certain things from just passing through the membrane. It's going to maintain a barrier. We say it's selectively permeable or semi-permeable. Now, the green blobs there, those are the proteins. But here's the thing, they don't really look like green blobs. Because remember from the last chapter, we learned that what a protein really looks like is this primary chain with secondary structures and then it's folded all up into a tertiary structure. But now that we're talking about it on a higher level, we don't draw out the whole protein, we just represent it with a blob. So that green blobs are representing these folded up proteins. Proteins do all sorts of things, um, and again, we'll go into this more next chapter. One of the things is that they can be channels. Sometimes you have something, for example, glucose, sugar. Sugar cannot pass through the phospholipids. It's too big, plus it's got polar parts to it, so it's not going to be able to go through. But you have special membrane proteins that act as channels, like tunnels, and they're specific to glucose, and they let glucose through. So one of the jobs of proteins in the membrane is that they can let certain things come in or out that couldn't get through the phospholipid portion. Another thing they can do is they can be receptors. For example, a hormone can attach to a membrane protein and then that will send a message inside. Like if somebody came to our door but they weren't allowed to come in, but they could give me a message and then I could send it to you. That would be a receptor protein. And lastly, they can be markers, like ID markers. Um, that's why I couldn't just give anybody in here a kidney of mine. You would, your body might reject it, would probably reject it, because we have different ID markers that identify what's supposed to be in our body and what's not. That's why when they look for donors, they look for tissue match. Uh, they're looking for somebody that's got at least enough ID markers in common with you that there's a chance that you'll, you'll accept the organ. But in addition to that, they give you drugs that lower your immune response that help you to, you know, to prevent from rejecting it but oftentimes it's a sister or a brother that can donate a kidney because they're gonna have similar ID markers to what you have. All right, the nucleus is the biggest thing in the cell. We're gonna look at cells with a nucleus. We're gonna actually look at cheek cells later this week where you'll scrape with a toothpick. I don't know if anybody's ever done that lab before, but you scrape it with a toothpick and then um, you, uh, you'll we'll stain them and we'll look at them under the microscope and you'll be able to see the nucleus. It's the biggest part of the cell. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see the endoplasmic reticulum or the ribosomes, they're just too small. 
It actually has a double membrane around it, but again, with the microscopes we have, it's not going to look, you're not going to be able to see a double membrane. It's got little pores in it also because, uh, for example, when DNA sends the message out to make proteins, which by the way was the answer on the test about the relationship between nucleic acids and proteins, the nucleic acids were the directions to make the proteins. So the nuclear envelope has pores that allow certain things to pass through. DNA can't, but RNA can, if you ever remember learning about protein synthesis. Um, when, when you first learn about the nucleus, a lot of times on a very elementary level, you're taught the nucleus is the control center. It tells the cell what to do. And that's not exactly true. It's not telling the mitochondria what to do. It's not telling the cell membrane what to do. What it's doing is it's controlling what proteins are made. And since proteins are the enzymes and the hormones and the structures of the cell, by controlling what proteins are made, they're really going to be determining the main functions of that type of cell. But they're not the boss as in directing all the other organelles. They don't tell all the organelles what to do. The DNA, yesterday when we talked about the bacteria, I said that they had one chromosome. What was the shape of their one chromosome? A lot of mumbling, but I think I think somebody said it. I, I asked what the shape was of a bacterial a bacterial DNA. Uh, exactly, it's, 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 it's a loop. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a loop. I said it would be all kind of tangled up, but if you stretched it out, it would be a circle, a loop. Um, remember, our DNA is not. Our DNA is linear. It's in chromosomes. But when the cell's not dividing, you cannot see the chromosomes. All you see is a blob called chromatin. I stopped the timer, by the way, just so you know. Um, so it's got this blob called chromatin or chromatin. It depends how you want to pronounce it. Uh, bottom line, we'll learn later why it looks like a blobby mass and not chromosomes, um, but we're not going to talk about it right now. And then there's a dark area inside the nucleus called the nucleolus, and the nucleolus is in charge of making what's called rRNA. Anybody remember what the little r stands for? Right. Yeah, ribosomal RNA. It actually is the type of RNA that makes up the ribosomes. You may have learned the other two kinds of RNA, mRNA and tRNA, may sound familiar to you. All right, so that's, that's the nucleus. And you may even be able to see the nucleolus. Um, when, when we look at onions or when we look at cheek cells, you may be able to see the nucleolus inside the nucleus. Okay, I have a diagram of the nucleus here. Sorry, if you didn't get it, it'll be up, it'll be up later. Um, the big picture is the cell. The big circle in the middle, that's the nucleus. And then the dark area inside, that's the nucleolus. And all the little kind of blobby looking stuff, that's the chromatin. When the cell's dividing, you would actually see little X-shaped chromosomes. They would be shaped like X's. But right now, because the cell's not dividing, you don't see them. Yes? Can you explain chromosome again? Yeah. Chromatin, chromosomes, when we draw them, when we draw them like X's, we make it look like it's just a strand of DNA and a strand of DNA. But that's not really what it is. What it really is, is a strand of DNA that's like coiled, and then the coils are like super coiled around proteins, and so they're all coiled up really, really tight. Well, the thing is, in order for the DNA to do its job, it's like a book. When it's coiled up like that, it's like the book is closed. So you can't read a book if it's closed. So when the cell's not dividing, those chromosomes uncoil, meaning all the string that's all wrapped up around a spool just kind of unwinds. So now you end up with this just big stringy looking mess. And that's, and that's, not, that's during the entire life of the cell when it's not dividing. And that's when the chromosomes are doing their job. They're being read to make proteins. So that's what chromatin is. It's just a big stringy mess because the chromosomes are all spread out like a book being opened so they can be read. The instructions can be read. All right, last thing for today, the ER, endoplasmic reticulum. It basically looks like a, a bunch of long tubes. It's a network of canals. And it does exactly that. It transports things through the cell. It usually starts right outside of the nucleus. So you'll actually see the nucleus and then you'll see these long tubes. 
And you don't want to get um, the ER mixed up with the Golgi bodies. I don't know if you remember learning about Golgi yeah. bodies. But it's very obvious the difference. If you had me for bio, you may remember this. Here's, here's your cell, here's the nucleus, and the ER would look kind of like this, like long canals. The Golgi bodies look like this. I always told them to remember sacks, stacks of sacks. They look like a little stack of pancakes. So the ER is always going to look like long tubes. That's how it's going to look different than the Golgi bodies when we talk about them. All right, so the job of the ER, uh, here's a picture of it, by the way. If you look, um, the TV is a better picture. The nucleus is stained blue in the picture, and the purple, I think, is a mitochondria. The yellow tubes, that's the Golgi bodies. I mean the Golgi bodies, I'm sorry. That's the rough, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. What are the dots? What are the red dots? Those are the ribosomes, exactly, because remember you have rough ER and smooth ER, and this would be rough ER because it looks bumpy because of the ribosomes. And this is the last thing I'll put up and we'll stop with this. Rough ER and smooth ER. Rough has the ribosomes around it. Its job is to modify proteins. The smooth ER does not have ribosomes around it. Its job is to make lipids. And another thing that the smooth ER does that's important is it's the one that does detoxification. Like when you take antibiotics, what breaks them down? The smooth ER. Um, alcohol, smooth ER. You know, aspirin, a Tylenol, it's the smooth ER. So if the smooth ER is responsible for detoxifying drugs, what organ in your body do you think has lots of cells that contain a lot of smooth ER? Liver. The liver, exactly, because your liver detoxifies drugs. Your liver would have cells that have lots and lots of smooth ER.